the zero to one moment is a big deal. And maybe we've now gone from like one to 10. And in some sense that should feel like a bigger deal, but I think it doesn't quite to most people. And maybe we go from like 10 to a hundred in the next 18 months. Uh, but I think like everybody's already accepted that AGI is going to happen and life is going on and you know, you're still all out here doing whatever you're doing. OpenAI's CEO, Sam Altman, recently sat down with legendary venture capitalist Vinod Kosla to talk about the future of AI and its impact on the global economy. When most people hear the word disruption in the context of AI, the first thought is usually job loss, humans being replaced by machines. And yes, that's part of it. But Altman and Kosla began their talk by focusing on something bigger, the disruption of Fortune 500 companies themselves. Altman argued that AI agents will eventually make entire SAAS companies obsolete. Instead of paying billions for software products maintained by vast corporate structures, AI systems could instantly generate custom-built applications on demand. In other words, the need for traditional software companies might disappear entirely. So go a little bit deeper. Like, what happens to today's companies? Um, I gave a talk this morning that I'll repeat for ILPs this afternoon. I figured there will be a faster demise of the Fortune 500 in the 2030s than we've ever seen. Uh, in, in which ones survive and which ones don't is gonna um, depend on what they do, but a faster demise. Uh, do you agree? Do you disagree? I don't know. Yeah, I, I, my instinct would be faster, but I haven't thought about that much. Um, the, the thing that I've been focused on is what it, you know, most of my, most of my time outside of OpenAI I spent with sort of software companies. And I, I've thought that I have understood the sort of like physics of software companies for a while. But if we're heading towards a world where any software you want can be like just in time written, and if you want to do something, you can just like type something into an AI chatbot and get a great piece of software built. Uh, and so instead of like, you know, going to like buy this SaaS company's product or that one, you just say like, run. And it happens. That that feels like a very significant change that is not that far away. I will come back to the next eighteen months and talk about that too. But big Fortune five hundred companies that are like managing complex supply chains, I, I, like the physical world, always takes longer. But the software change feels like it's it's closer. But twenty forty is long enough That's for long. the physical world to change enough. That's why I picked the twenty thirty five to twenty fifty period. 2035 is only 10 years away. Yeah, I, I, I would bet. I would bet that most current companies fail to adapt quickly enough and get, you know, some significant losses because of that. This idea isn't just theory. It mirrors a recent comment from Elon Musk, who suggested building a company called MacroHard, a purely AI-driven software company that competes directly with firms like Microsoft. The name was tongue-in-cheek, but the vision is real. If a company like Microsoft doesn't produce physical goods and is essentially just a giant machine for producing and selling software, then why couldn't an AI simulate it completely? Think about that. One of the world's most valuable corporations, Microsoft, derives its power from selling digital products. If AI can create those products instantly and for free, what is left of Microsoft's business model? And if Microsoft is vulnerable, so are countless other tech giants that rely on software as their core product. This is the long-term existential threat. SaaS titans like Microsoft could be wiped out by the very technology they helped pioneer. SaaS titans like Microsoft, Salesforce, or Adobe may one day find themselves disrupted not by human competitors, but by AI systems that make their offerings redundant. Five years from then, if you look forward, which even 18 months from now, the end of 26, how much of a change in AI capability from today to the end of 26 
and I'm getting very short term now versus what we saw between ChatGPT moment and today two and a half years ago I'm not sure how to like measure that from a, from a vibes basis I would expect well I think going from nothing to the first version of ChatGPT was maybe like the biggest system shock most people will feel because it was like all right there wasn't this thing at all and now there's this thing and sure it wasn't very good but the the zero to one moment is a big deal and maybe we've now gone from like one to ten and in some sense that should feel like a bigger deal but I think it doesn't quite to most people and maybe we go from like 10 to 100 in the next 18 months uh but I think like everybody's already accepted that AGI is going to happen and life is going on and you know you're still all out here doing whatever you're doing um so clueless or not well I, again I think like the actual progress on the merits will be astonishing but it, it, it's expected to be astonishing whereas ChatGPT was a very unexpected thing to most yeah. people so I don't, I don't think it'll like feel as wild uh, even though the impact will be much larger Kosla then pushed Altman on a more immediate question what happens in the next year and a half Altman's answer was striking AI will jump from 10 to 100 in capability, but he cautioned that the leap may not feel as dramatic as people imagine. To put it another way, the world has already experienced its zero to one moment with ChatGPT. That initial shock, when people first realized what generative AI could do, will never be repeated in quite the same way. The cat is already out of the bag. However, the next stage is not about surprise, it's about adoption. If enterprises rapidly integrate these systems into their workflows, replacing tasks once done by humans, then AI will stop being just a flashy demo and start becoming invisible infrastructure. I think about, which is, when do you think AI scientists start doing most of the AI research? I think it'll be very gradual. Um, it, it's not a, you know, like let's say today that an open AI researcher is, is using Codex and it's generating 10% of their PRs and then 20% and 30%. And then it's, and then it's like starting to, uh, actually go test some new model architectures itself, but it's, you know, still like the researcher sort of directing it. And then it's like doing a little bit more of the, like, all right, here's the hypotheses to go test. Um, but the researcher is still like, feels like they're just working more efficiently. And the researcher might say, I'm doing 100% of the research. I just have better tools. But if that researcher is now outputting 2x or 10x what they could before, um, you know, let's say 10x, do you count the AI is doing 90% of the research at that point? Or 0% because it's not fully autonomously doing the whole loop? I think it's going to be this sort of like messy joint acceleration. So one doesn't have to measure it but one can look at the rate of change of new, of progress and the acceleration. That's sort of, to me, the ultimate measure, what happens to the rate of change beyond just the scaling laws yeah. which we've just talked about. I think we will move much faster on the research front every year from here on because we have better tools. Yeah. So whether you want to call that AI assisting humans or humans assisting AI or AI doing the research itself, the net effect will be much faster, not only algorithmic process, but the whole, the whole like supply chain. If AI is helping us build data centers faster, if it's helping us de develop new sorts of um, chips, including pretty exotic stuff much faster, I think that all counts. And so, yeah, if you look at it as sort of a rate of progress, and as long as the AI is somehow helping that go faster, you count that as the AI doing part of the research, then, then I think much, much faster. Yeah. So where might the next chat GPT level shock come from? Altman suggested it could arrive when AI begins making genuine scientific discoveries. Right now, AI accelerates research by analyzing data finding patterns, or generating hypotheses faster than humans. 
But imagine a world where AI doesn't just speed up the process. It creates entirely new ideas, new theories, and even tests them independently. Altman believes this scenario may be closer than most people think. I mean, my think. guess is that in the, the short, short term, the AI software engineer will be the most disruptive thing to enterprises. It, it like the companies are investing the most in that the fastest. There's a bunch of like quirky reasons why it's a particularly great environment. Um, it so directly translates to a, a current limiting reagent for most companies and a revenue opportunity. So I, I would bet that that will be kind of like the big story for the rest of the year. There will be other things too, but like you will just start to see companies who get good at this or teams that get good at this significantly able to outperform other ones. Um, clearly, software development, I think pretty much everybody recognizes is a major area, a uh, major new area. Um, what about traditional enterprise functions beyond software? Yeah, I, I think those are, again, this is not a theoretical thing anymore. Like, we hear from companies that are like, I am doing all of my customer support with AI now. I'm doing all of my outbound sales with AI. I'm doing all of my, you know, pick your other vertical. Uh, so that's all happening too. I just don't think it'll have like quite the same visible Magnitude. impact. Yeah. Returning to the present, Kosla pressed Altman to identify specific jobs or industries that will be disrupted first. Altman was cautious and deliberately vague, but he did imply that clerical, support, and repetitive roles are among the earliest to be automated away. While he avoided making a precise prediction, the message was clear. The ripple effects will start in areas where human labor is routine and easily modeled. In the short term, AI adoption will reshape jobs and companies at an accelerating pace. In the long term, it could completely rewrite the rules of capitalism, replacing giants like Microsoft with AI-driven alternatives. And beyond that, it may even redefine human progress itself if AI begins to generate new scientific we'll roll out knowledge. And how do we ensure benefits of AI spread more globally, more equally? Uh, so there's, there's sort of this worry of the rich get richer because then the inside circle, uh, the situational awareness paper talks about there's only a few hundred people who understand how large this change is and how fast it's happening. But talk about the global implications and how we ensure equity and broader usage of, and spread of the benefits. First, within even this country, because there's an asymmetry to it, uh, and, and then globally. So I don't want to be like all, I resent the question. But I don't want to be all negative on it because I think there is something important to it. But, you know, ChatGPT is, I think, the fifth biggest website in the world now. It is, if it stays on its current trajectory, which is hard to do, it will be the biggest website in the world. There will be billions of people that are using free AGI at some point. Everyone will have access to great medical advice. Everyone will have access to great education. Everybody will have the ability to, like, ask for any software to be made. And for free, we will just do it for you. Um, and that is like, that is how technology works. And I think capitalism is like really great. It does not mean we don't have to correct around the edges. I think we do. I think there's important stuff to, that we will, will need to address differently. But, but on the whole, the way this benefits the world is that technology benefits the world. Um, you put tools in the hands of people, you make them free or low cost and people do amazing things. And I think like, there are a lot of people who I think there are a lot of people who think that oh you know the world is not ready for this they can't handle it there's only a few people that can understand it there's that paper there's many others but I think people really kind of do know what they need and they're pretty good about learning how to use new technology and it's and again this is not like theoretical this is like at mass scale happening today and I think it's quite wonderful and it's happening because like the existing systems and incentives in the world are phenomenal in many ways. Uh, again, there will be some things we have to do differently. If AI starts making massive scientific discoveries, you know, some company will use AI to discover cures for every cancer. And I hope those people get really rich, but also everybody else in the world, I hope they get a cheap cure for cancer. 
someone uses AI to make fusion commercializable. I hope these people get really rich, but the whole world will benefit from plummeting electricity prices. So I, I kind of just think like technology on the whole does a lot to spread massive global benefit. And the story of the last couple of hundred years has been that. And we should not be ashamed of that. We should not like try to explain away why what we do is not is not so evil. Like it's it's really been great. Um, there will be some things that I think are different about AI. Uh, you can imagine a world where compute becomes a crazy scarce resource and deciding somehow democratically deciding what problems we go after in what order with massive amounts of compute needs a little bit of a different approach than we've had in the past. Um, you can imagine access to compute for, um, you know, you could imagine like most capital in the world decides it wants to like have access to compute and that becomes like a crazy expensive, crazy limited thing. That would be bad, but my answer about how to solve that, at least the first try on how to solve it, would be just like make way, way more compute. Um, I think this, I've gone back and forth, so I'm not confident, but I think this should be a force towards um, more equality in the world, not further divergence. This leads to the most important question of all. What happens to power and wealth distribution? Will AI wipe out the Fortune 500 and concentrate dominance into the hands of a few new tech giants? Maybe the Fortune 50, or even the Fortune 5? Or will it do the opposite, breaking down barriers and leveling the playing field, allowing small players to compete with billion-dollar companies? Altman leans toward the second outcome, a world where AI makes everyone richer, not just a handful of corporations. He points to historical examples where technology expanded opportunity rather than shrinking it. But, as he admitted, he is hardly a neutral observer. As the leader of one of the most powerful AI labs in the world, his view is inevitably shaped by bias. <laughs>